Um, Mr. Chairman, we've taken some partisan hits today, some good-natured, some a little less so, so forgive me for taking a second just to respond to a little bit of the incoming fire here. Uh, the ranking member uh, kicked it off by saying that we were going around in circles before we brought the Build Back Better Act forward today, and everyone had a good laugh about that, and the only thing I can do there is quote uh, Mark Twain, who said, I don't belong to an organized party, I'm a Democrat. Um, <clears throat> Was it really Will Rogers? Well, all the more appropriate then. I guess Mark Twain stole it from him. But, uh, but uh, certainly uh, Mark Twain was a Democrat. I think Will Rogers was a Democrat. You can correct me. And, uh, you know, we are the party of Social Security. We are the party of Medicare. We are the party of Medicaid. We're the party of the Affordable Care Act. We're the party of the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act. And all those things were called socialism back when they started, uh, not by people in our party, but by people in the other party. They called it socialist back then. And we do have internal democracy in our party, too. This is true. We are a much bigger party. Uh, we have millions more people in it than the other party. Um, <clears throat> and we're not run by one man. We don't let one person dictate to us everything we're going to do. So there's democracy, there's debate, and so on. Uh, I think Mr. Smith said there was disarray and division. You know what? We haven't overthrown the chair of the Democratic caucus. We didn't depose the chair of the Democratic caucus for taking a vote to impeach the first president in American history to incite a violent insurrection against the union to try to overthrow a presidential election. So I see disarray and division in the party that's going after two, at least two, very fine members. I know they're leading members of the GOP caucus who are saying that uh, Liz Cheney, the former chair of the House Republican Caucus just earlier this year, and Adam Kinzinger should be stripped of their committee assignments. Wow. Talk about division. Talk about disarray. So uh, dictatorship's a lot more efficient. One person tells everybody what to think. Democracy, yeah. A lot of different voices. But you know what? I think the world has found, for example, in World War II, you can't push a democracy too far without people coming back and saying, we're not going any further than that. And our party has been the party of social progress in the country. And I understand we have different philosophies of government. That's cool. We don't have to insult each other. We believe that the government must be an instrument of the common good for the common man and the common woman. Franklin D. Roosevelt called our party the democracy. He said, the royalists say you invest in the richest people in society and some of that wealth will filter down everybody else. But the democracy says you invest in the working people, the common man and the common woman of the country, and everybody will benefit from it. That's basically the exact same debate that is being played out in this discussion about the Build Back Better plan, which is a worthy successor to the New Deal, a democratic initiative, the Great Society, a democratic initiative. And I understand the other philosophy is that, well, we shrink government down to the purposes of military, police, courts, national security state, and do whatever we can to help the corporations and then everybody else fend for themselves. So we just have two different views about that. I do want to say a word about political nomenclature, though, because the word socialism, I noticed, was bandied about a lot. And I've been hearing that in a lot of my committee hearings. And one can only uh, assume the blissful ignorance of the gentleman about the fact that Social Security was called socialist. Medicare was called socialist. And so now they're calling the idea of universal daycare for American children socialist. I, and I, I just don't know what to say about that. because. They seem to have forgotten that they used to think that Social Security was socialist and Medicare was socialist. Sometimes they claim some credit for Medicare or Social Security. They want to take, they want to take advantage of it now to say, oh, well, we're part of that. Uh, that's not really socialist anymore, uh, even though we would like to privatize those things. But OK, so now we have a new program to call socialist, daycare for American children. Well, it's not what I hear from my constituents. They want daycare. The working class families, the middle class families, the struggling poor families in my district, 
They want daycare. It's making it very difficult for people to get back to work and support their families. So for those who seem to think that they're going to be able to destroy this great new initiative by calling it socialist, you know what? I'm going to go back and I'm going to quote to you all of the great programs which you seem to be a little bit more comfortable with today, which were called socialist by your predecessors. Now, I, Mr. Chairman, forgive me for taking up a cause that you have championed here, but there are some people who seem to be incapable of pronouncing the name of our party in its adjectival form. It's the most remarkable thing in the world. When you use it as a noun, then I am a Democrat. But the name of the party is the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party. That's what we call ourselves. So we take that as an insult. It would be as if you came in here and I just said, oh, the Banana Republican Party says this, and that Banana Republican, I don't think that's the correct adjective. I think it's still Republican. We don't just go out calling you guys Banana Republicans like that. So at least I think the chairman has established for a while that we will use the adjectival form of each other's parties that are preferred by the members of the party. That is a basic gesture of civility. Now, Mr. Neal, um, I've been in a number of committees where I'm hearing people rail about the fact that the budget committee wants to increase the amount of resources that the IRS has. Um, now, when I saw that, I thought, great, because I hear about tax cheats billionaire tax cheats. I know some people brag about the fact that they don't pay any taxes. Um, and you know what? I, I read an interesting book about how in a lot of democratic countries, the tax collection service are considered heroes to the country. There are even TV shows, like in Italy, about tax collectors who are the great heroes of the country because they go after the people who are ripping off everybody else. And that's the way I feel about it. Nobody loves paying taxes, because obviously we prefer to get everything for free. But we're grown-ups. We understand that's not how civilization works. That's not how society works. But you know what makes me mad? When I see the middle class, working class people of my district paying their taxes, and we pay our taxes, and yet there are people who are tax cheaters and tax skates who try to get away with nothing. So that was my reaction to that. But I wonder if you would address the fact that I'm hearing people say they're trying to hire thousands more tax collectors. They're trying to put mo more money into tax enforcement. Is that a bad thing? Mr. Raskin, I was the first. Oh, my God. Hang on, Eddie. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Mr. Raskin, I was the first one to tackle the inversion issue back in the early 90s. And we shut it down temporarily. And then when they were able to get around that, then I went back and filed it again in 203, another piece of legislation, and we shut it down again. The reality is today that wealthier people are paid through dividends and stock options. It's harder for successful auditors at the IRS to seek out that revenue. The example I used before, though, that I think is applicable, and that is the earned income tax credit. The earned in income tax credit, Gerald Ford signed, Ronald Reagan endorsed as the best anti-poverty program that you could come across. And the truth is, though, you're more likely to be audited today if you claim the EITC. So back to compliance. We should be proud of one thing. About, again, on average, about 85 percent of the American people pay their taxes. Even if it's grudgingly, they pay them. But there is still a pretty stubborn number that use offshore accounts, as demonstrated recently by a lot of good reporting from ProPublica and others. And even on the international tax front, there's another major issue. And I think that we're not that far apart, I think, on how we would like to have profits reported as to where they've been earned. That's the argument. What happens is that you have profit shifting largely based upon treaty negotiations where you avoid taxes by earning them in one place and reporting them as having been earned in another place. So when you look at what we're asking here for Mr. For President Biden, he's asking for an $80 billion investment, technology, software, obviously, more agents, and more professional agents, those who have backgrounds in tax uh, compliance. This is a very reasonable request that we're making. And the last point I'll make, between 2010 and, and uh, 2020, 
the IRS funding was cut by 20 percent. They're a shell of what they used to be. I appreciate that clarification very much. I want to ask about the investment in kids. And so this would go to Mr. Yarmouth, and I don't know if Mr. Scott is still with us. Um, but the working families in my district have been struggling with the cost of raising uh, their kids. And Build Back Better makes the largest investment in child care in American history, providing free preschool for all three-year-olds and four-year-olds. So first of all, what do you say about the claim, this is just socialism, and it's socialist to want to invest in the education of our kids? Is it just democratic socialist countries that invest in daycare you know, and uh, pre-K? Well, on the subject of pre-K, we're, I, th I believe, the only industrialized nation that doesn't already have it. Uh, most, co most countries have recognized the value of getting kids a strong early foundation. Some of the reasons have been mentioned earlier that a lot of kids grew up in households where they don't get the attention and don't have the resources that uh, many other families do, and they suffer because of that. You know, there have been studies that show that um, for every dollar spent on, on pre-K, there was a 3 to $7 return in terms of uh, subsequent earnings and savings because they don't end up in, uh, in need of, of public support. So the way I look at it, and then we talked about child care and, and, uh, as a, a means of allowing parents to get back in the workforce. We know there are about 2 million uh, mothers right now, single mothers, who are out of the workforce because they can't afford child care, purely and simply. So you're, you're limiting the, the growth of that family. But, but I look at this, again, as an investment in our future. I know that in some areas where they have pre-K education right now, in this country, and there are some that have it, they've had to totally rewrite the high school curriculums because the kids are so much more advanced than the kids before that. So, you know, when we've got, uh, you know, more and a higher and higher percentage of our kids uh, are now being born to families of color. Statistically, that means they will have uh, less, fewer resources than white families. That's our tax base mm. a generation from now and two generations from now. This is all in our self-interest, as far as I can see, to make sure that there, is, there are workers who are well-trained and well-educated, that there's a human humanitarian aspect of this, of course. We owe it to those kids. If they're yeah. born into unfortunate circumstances, we owe them the opportunity to have the best advantage possible. So this is futuristic. It's humanitarian. It's, it's, there's a strong economic argument to be made for it. And again, uh, we're really the only country, civil, again, industrialized nation in the world that doesn't do it already. That's not doing it already. I don't know, is Chairman Scott still out there? Uh, okay. Um, well, I appreciate that. And, and I don't know why um, there are those who continue to lambaste it as, uh, as socialism. Uh, you know, I know that, that President Trump's best buddy was Vladimir Putin, who was the former head of the KGB, and I know the communists hate the socialists, so maybe it's got something to do with that. But this is a democratic program. This is a pro-democracy program, and it's pro-child, and it's pro-family, and it's pro-future. Exactly. Um, and so, I, you know, I, speaking as one, am very supportive of what you're doing here, and I will not accept any propaganda or disinformation about this or about COVID-19, or about the election, which right. Joe Biden won by more than 7 million mm -hmm. votes, or about January 6th, where uh, the insurrectionists did not greet the officers with hugs and kisses, as right. Donald Trump said, but rather wounded up more than 140 of them. Uh, and I'm not going to take any propaganda and disinformation about this. It's getting very dangerous for democracy that we can't have a real discussion on the facts about legislation before us. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Can I make, just make yeah. two, two quick comments again? One is to repeat that uh, so much of the money we're allocating here is to build capacity, is to, to be able to provide money so that child care workers can, that the child care worker's job is an attractive job, so you get the high caliber people. And the same with pre-K teachers. Uh, this is not going to be an easy thing to have universal pre-K, but if you, you know, we talked about whether, you know, this should be, uh, they, they wanted to limit the income as, as to who could get a universal pre-K. It's universal pre-K because you have to have, make it universal in order to make it economically viable. You can't just set it up as a voluntary thing where, and you give people money because there won't be anybody going to that field. You won't have facilities built to house those. 
those kids. So it has to be universal, just as we have universal public education. Of course. Well, and let me just say that that's what works in a democracy. You make public education for everybody. You make Social Security for everybody. You make health care for everybody. You make voting rights for everybody. And those who want to chop the public up into uh, little pieces obviously want to undermine public support for particular programs. Thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chairman. I yield back.